Hello and welcome to today's training, Bipolar Disorder, Psychosocial Treatment Strategies with Dr. Lauren M. Weinstock, PhD. I am Helen Heyman, Director of Programs at ADA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. We will first kindly ask you to mute yourselves so that we don't hear any background noise. To mute yourself, you will need to press the gray tab just below the red arrow. Kindly also switch off your webcam. The webcam tab is just below the mute tab. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat panel of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You will also be able to access materials. If you registered and paid for continuing education credit, you will first need to provide the four-letter CE code on the webinar evaluation form. The link to the evaluation form in SurveyMonkey will be sent to you 48 hours after the end of the professional webinar. You can either answer the assessment questions at the end of this webinar by staying online. At the end of the talk, a screen will come up with the questions. You will have 10 minutes to answer them. Once you answered the questions, please click Submit. And now I would like to introduce our expert. Dr. Lauren Weinstock, PhD, is a licensed psychologist and associate professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University, where she holds clinical appointments at Butler Hospital, Rhode Island Hospital, and the Providence VA Medical Center. Lauren is also a faculty affiliate of the Brown Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights. She maintains a federally funded program of research focused on the development and evaluation of adjunctive behavioral interventions for bipolar disorder and suicide prevention, particularly around vulnerable transitions in care, going from inpatient to outpatient treatment across the perinatal period and from criminal justice to community settings. Complementing this work is research focused on elucidating the continuum between unipolar and bipolar mood disorders using both statistical and experimental approaches and studies on the clinical management of bipolar disorder, such as diagnostic processes, use of polypharmacy and routine care. Dr. Weinstock is currently the co-president of the Bipolar Disorders Special Interest Group of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies as, and is on the editorial board for the journal Behavior Therapy. She has served on several national and international work groups tasked with generating recommendations concerning effective assessment and treatment of bipolar disorder and suicide risk. It is a true honor and, pro and pleasure to work with this professional. I will now pass the screen along to Dr. Weinstock. Okay, okay wonderful. Thank you for that um, kind in, uh, introduction, Helen, and um, the invitation on behalf of ADAA to present to everyone today. I also wanted to offer a personal thank you to those of you who were registered to attend this webinar in March. I um, had a personal family conflict that was very unexpected and um, prevented me from giving the talk back in March, but I'm happy to um, be with you all today doing so. Um, just to start off, I have no um, conflicts of interest to disclose, and I um, want to just start with a, um, a brief overview of the objectives for the webinar today. One of the things that I think is incredibly important before we start talking about treatment strategies is to provide some um, overview of the challenges that are encountered in the assessment and diagnosis of bipolar disorder. They're very relevant 
to um, to really understanding the best ways to treat people because um, they've often experienced a lot of frustration themselves in the healthcare system, um, just getting a correct diagnosis. I'll also be providing a very brief overview of pharmacotherapy for bipolar disorder. I'm a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, so pharmacotherapy is not an area of my expertise, but um, it can be helpful to have a brief overview before moving into a discussion of psychosocial treatment strategies. And um, as we talk about them today, I'm going to focus on the common elements that are shared across many of these treatment approaches, as well as some of the unique intervention components that um, differentiate the treatments. I'll also be summarizing the data um, supporting the use of adjunctive psychotherapies for bipolar disorder. And the, my main goal for you today is not that um, you can necessarily leave here after an hour and be able to apply these strategies yourself, but it'll give you a, hopefully a, a deeper understanding of what these treatments entail so that if you're interested in learning more um, about how to integrate these into your own practice, that um, you'll have a better idea of which ones might be a better fit for you. So um, to start off, I think it's really important to remember that we don't actually start with the diagnosis as a place to begin, we, or the disorder, I should say, as a place to begin. We really start with mood episodes, and these are the building blocks of our diagnoses for bipolar disorder. You can see here, we tend to think of um, our mood episodes as existing on a spectrum from the upper limit of this, this slide says normal mood. I prefer to refer to it as neutral mood because um, for many of the, the patients I treat, um, their normal mood is a manic or depressive state and um, they don't reside in um, a euthymic state as often. And um, so normal is, I guess, relative and subjective. So um, regardless, mania sort of represents that upper end of the spectrum marked by um, marked uh, elevated or euphoric or irritable mood and increased energy and goal-directed activity and several additional symptoms, whereas hypomania reflects a um, less severe form of mania, typically shorter duration, also marked by um, less functional impairment. In fact, part of the diagnosis of a hypomanic episode is that people don't report um, experiencing functional impairment as a result of the symptoms. And then of course, on the lower end of the spectrum, um, periods of major depressive episodes marked by depressed or anhedonic mood and many of the symptoms that accompany depression. And um, once the clinician or whoever's doing the assessment um, is able to determine presence or absence of each of these mood episodes, then somebody's ready to um, formulate a diagnosis. For bipolar one disorder, the top line on this slide, you can see that um, it requires a history of manic episode only. So um, even though depression, a major depressive episode is quite common in bipolar one disorder, in fact, roughly 90% of people with bipolar disorder our bipolar one disorder will report experiencing a major depressive episode. It's not actually required for the diagnosis. Whereas for bipolar two disorder, this diagnosis requires a history of both hypomanic and major depressive episodes in order for somebody to meet um, threshold criteria. And then this is just in contrast to major depressive disorder, which um, would be given for somebody who has a history of major depressive episodes and um, no history of manic or hypomanic episodes. Very briefly to touch on the epidemiology of mood disorders, it's important to reflect on the fact that bipolar one and bipolar two disorder um, relative to some of our other psychiatric disorders are not super high prevalence. They're roughly three to 4% combined, especially when you add in um, those what used to be called not otherwise specified or not elsewhere classified um, diagnoses on that spectrum. But I, I bring this up to highlight that even though they're relatively low prevalence disorders, they have a really high impact um, in terms of the functional impairment that people personally experience, but also in terms of their public health impact. At one point, the World Health Organization had identified bipolar disorder in the top 10 most burdensome illnesses worldwide, which is really not proportional to um, the, the prevalence, but because it's such an impairing condition, um, that's where we are. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that the rate of diagnosis is rising. This has received a lot of attention in the youth literature and youth um, clinical context where 
absolutely those diagnoses have increased exponentially in the last few decades. But what's received less attention is that the rate of diagnosis of bipolar disorder in adults has increased over the same time period as well. And so the question is, why might this be happening? It might just simply be that the rate of the disorder is increasing. It might be that clinicians are becoming more aware of bipolar disorder and are um, more frequently assessing for history of mania and hypomania. It might also be a reflection of how our diagnoses change over time. Um, one of the biggest changes was the introduction of bipolar II disorder in DSM-4. Um, so there, there just might be a wider net that we're casting with respect to who might meet those criteria for um, a bipolar disorder diagnosis. But it might also be that um, people may be misdiagnosed, and there's some evidence that that may also be true. One of the challenges that um, we've encountered, and these are some data from a clinic sample actually collected here in Rhode Island, where um, people are presenting to clinics for treatment saying that they have bipolar disorder, and then we're discovering that they may not actually meet criteria for the disorder. So in this case, these are people who presented for outpatient treatment in a, um, it's a fully functioning clinic, but they also have integrated research. And they just simply asked people, do you have bipolar disorder, yes or no? And then they looked to see how many of those people actually met the criteria for bipolar disorder when um, they participated in a structured clinical interview. And what was somewhat alarming was that roughly 56% of the people who came to the clinic reporting that they had bipolar disorder actually did not meet criteria for the disorder when um, they completed the structured clinical interview. But it's also important to recognize that there might be some people who are not being correctly identified. So it's a much smaller proportion, but you can see here, this is roughly five to 6% of the people who came to the clinic who did not believe they had bipolar disorder. It turns out upon structured clinical interview, they did. And that's also consistent with data that have been collected. These are data from the National Depressive and Manic Depressive Association, now called the Depressive and Bipolar Support Alliance. And they um, surveyed their members and they simply asked people with bipolar disorder, were you ever misdiagnosed? And you can see here over two thirds of the sample have had an experience where they received the wrong diagnosis or incorrect diagnosis. And then they also asked people, how long did it take from when you first presented for treatment to when you got a correct bipolar disorder diagnosis? How long did that take? And you can see here, there's some variability, but um, for people with bipolar one disorder, that was roughly six years. For people with bipolar two disorder, alarmingly, that was roughly 12 years. And on average, it took about nine years for people um, to get that correct diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And not surprisingly, um, the, the diagnosis that they received um, prior to that was typically major depressive disorder, which of course is very prominent and a key part of bipolar disorder. So um, again, it's not a surprise, but it's also alarming because the treatments can be quite different. And speaking of depression, I think it's also important to acknowledge that um, while mania and hypomania are sort of the key features that we use to diagnose bipolar disorder, people report spending much more time in a depressive phase than a manic phase or hypomanic phase over the course of time. So these are data from um, a longitudinal study um, conducted over a few decades, the Collaborative Depression Study, and they assessed people at regular intervals across that time, and they found that people with bipolar one disorder spent approximately one third of that time. This is, I think on average, they had 10 to 12 years of data for each person. So one third of their lives um, experiencing some level of depression symptoms, and for people with bipolar two disorder, they spent roughly half of their lives experiencing some level of depression symptoms. So again, you can see how it could be very easy for, um, for them to be diagnosed as having major depressive disorder um, because they're most likely presenting for treatment um, when they're depressed. So these are just some key clinical questions that I think about when I consider treatment for bipolar disorder. Um, Related to the slides I just presented, one of the big questions is, is this even bipolar disorder? Um, I spend as much time diagnosing bipolar disorder as I do undiagnosing bipolar disorder in my clinical work. 
And, um, you know, especially for people who are working in very busy, busy clinical settings, it can be difficult because it requires um, quite a bit of time to really assess and often retrospectively assess presence of a prior manic or hypomanic episode. But there are some useful screening tools that um, people can uh, integrate into their clinical work that might help identify cases for further assessment. So these are not a, these are not assessments that are going to tell you yes or no. This person has a history of mania or hypomania, but um, they can be really helpful in terms of screening out people who seem very unlikely to have had a history of such, and identifying those people who require further assessment. I, I mentioned the mood disorder questionnaire. It's very widely used. It's free. It's available on the internet. So that, that itself is a good resource. I'd also point out, I think I mentioned this already, that um, it just unfortunately, clinic schedules are busy, but bipolar disorder does take some time to assess and it may um, require some prospective evaluation prior to finalizing a diagnosis. Um, I mentioned before that oftentimes we really do have to rely on retrospective assessment, especially when people are more likely presenting in a depressive episode when they come to treatment. And it can be really difficult to um, identify, especially a hypomanic episode, because um, people may not have even reflected on that being a uh, time in their lives that was clinically meaningful. And so um, recognizing that some prospective evaluation and giving yourself some time to finalize the diagnosis might be useful. And then of course, if it is bipolar disorder, really trying to differentiate between whether somebody might um, have bipolar one versus bipolar two disorder, um, it's especially relevant in terms of understanding their risk for mania um, in the future. The other um, questions that I think are very important, and I won't have a whole lot of time today to touch upon how to address clinically, but it's important to think about how highly comorbid um, other conditions are with bipolar disorder that might influence care. So um, thinking about um, anxiety and substance use as being um, factors that might be part of the clinical picture that will require attention and that might also complicate course of the bipolar illness itself. Is there any presence of psychosis for this person? Um, people may experience psychotic features in a depressive or a manic episode. Is there a history of trauma? Um, people with bipolar disorder on average tend to have um, a higher risk for having or rate of having trauma in their um, histories. And then um, also being very careful to assess current suicide risk and past suicide attempt history. Um, rate of suicide and suicide attempt in bipolar disorder is much higher than most other psychiatric conditions. And, um, and I would just recommend that that be part of the regular routine when working with people clinically, whether they're depressed or manic. There's also some evidence that when people experience mixed states where they have depression and manic symptoms um, kind of commingled with one another that that may place them at, at particularly high risk. Other questions to consider um, in terms of clinical care would be what level of clinical care is indicated? Does the patient require an inpatient or partial, partial hospital level of care? Is the patient presenting for acute versus maintenance treatment? You'll see that'll come up as a theme as I start talking about the treatments today. And um, of course, is the patient presenting for treatment of depression, hypomania, or both? Another piece of the puzzle is what other treatments people may be receiving, um, in particular pharmacotherapy for bipolar disorder. So I always try to be as proactive as I can about obtaining whatever releases of information I need to be able to communicate with their other treatment providers, whether it's a psychiatrist, nurse practitioner, primary care, um, some patients I work with do get their pharmacotherapy in primary care, and um, I, I would just recommend that that's a really important part of um, moving forward with treatment with somebody new, is making sure that your hands aren't tied and that you're able to communicate with the full treatment team. Of course, if you're not all in the same clinic, um, which would be the more ideal setup. So um, this is a good point to transition to pharmacotherapy. There are a number of published treatment guidelines for bipolar disorder, and they're very unambiguous about the importance of pharmacotherapy in terms of not just acute treatment, but also long-term management of the illness over time. And um, there, 
their recommendations about psychotherapy, which I'll get to soon, are really based on a literature that has evaluated adjunctive psychosocial interventions. So the, the literature has really not spoken at all to pharma or psychotherapy as a monotherapy for bipolar disorder. And I think that's important thing to keep in mind. So this slide is a little bit old, but it's really hard to find a really nice figure that sort of collapses all of the FDA approved treatments for bipolar disorder in adults. Um, there have been a couple of other medications that have been approved since this was published. Um, the one that comes to my mind is lorazodone for bipolar depression, but it still gives you a general sense of what um, the treatment landscape looks like for pharmacotherapy. Of course, we have lithium as a mood stabilizing treatment, um, one of the first pharmacotherapies um, not just for bipolar disorder, but for any psychiatric disorder. Um, bipolar disorder is also treated um, using antipsychotic medications due to some of their mood stabilizing properties, um, as well as some anticonvulsant medications. Another thing I'd really like to point out is the number of FDA approved medications we have for bipolar depression versus mania or, or mixed states. Um, there are very few which is an interesting contrast when you think about the fact that people spend one third to one half of their lives with depressive symptoms. It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg question because we can think maybe depression predominates and that's part of the natural course of the illness, but maybe part of why that's the natural course of the illness is because we don't have pharmacotherapies or as many pharmacotherapies that have been helpful in addressing acute treatment of bipolar depression. And um, actually, I'll go back for a moment just briefly. I'll also point out that you'll see on the left hand of the slide that there are no approved antidepressants for bipolar disorder. And um, you'll see there's an olanzapine fluoxetine combination that is approved for the treatment of bipolar depression. But um, that doesn't mean that antidepressants are not being used in routine care and um, their use is quite controversial. So these are data from the Systematic Treatment Evaluation Program for Bipolar Disorder, which was a large 15-site um, research study. I really think of it as a research network where they were funded to run a number of different trials, one of which was to evaluate the question of whether adding an antidepressant onto a mood stabilizer had any clinical benefit for people with bipolar disorder, and also on the reverse to determine what whether the risks um, were too great. The risks um, primarily being one that treating somebody, especially with bipolar one disorder with an antidepressant, the concern is that it might trigger a manic episode for them. And so the people have been very interested in this question, especially because antidepressants are so commonly used as adjuncts for the treatment of bipolar disorder. And you can see here from this slide, that um, there, while there was no real evidence that adding an antidepressant onto a mood stabilizer compared to placebo actually increased risk in any great way, um, the rate of mood switch was roughly equivalent between the two groups, there really was no um, significant benefit to adding an antidepressant onto a mood stabilizing treatment for folks with bipolar depression. So, um, you know, these data are quite a bit old now. This is over 10 years ago, and yet antidepressants are still used um, quite commonly. So that's something to keep in mind if you're treating someone with um, bipolar disorder with psychotherapy, that they may have a complicated uh, med regimen that does include the use of an antidepressant. And um, relevant to the complicated treatment regimens that we see, typically the clinical research literature on pharmacotherapies have focused on either a single compound or two compounds in combination um, for the treatment of bipolar disorder. Yet what we see in routine care is that polypharmacy is the norm. Um, these are actually data from our hospital here in Rhode Island. And these are folks um, who are coming to the hospitals. These are people who are acutely symptomatic. And we looked at the um, number of different psychiatric medications they were taking at the time of hospitalization. So this isn't what was changed in the hospital, but this is what was happening in the community. And we found that a little bit of a bimodal distribution here where almost 20% were taking no medication, but then over 50% of the folks were taking three or more, which is really challenging because the clinical research literature doesn't speak at all to the effectiveness or efficacy of combining three or more medications for the treatment of bipolar disorder. And so you can tell from these data that clinicians are really struggling to come up with best treatment. Um, and it's difficult when it's not guided by the literature. 
What they do have instead, which I referenced already, was um, published treatment guidelines. And these have been really published in response to the complexities in clinical management of bipolar disorder and the challenges that people face um, and clinicians face when um, the, the clinical trials literature can't really answer questions they have about combination treatment, yet they find themselves in a position where they feel that combination treatment is the best path forward for their patients. So these are just some examples. The CANMAT guidelines on the upper left-hand corner of the slide were just published a month or two ago. Um, those are hot off the press. Those are the ones that I tend to rely on, although again, I'm not providing pharmacotherapy. Um, there's a lot of other very useful information in those guidelines with respect to psychotherapies and, and just understanding um, course and outcome of bipolar disorder more generally. So um, coming to where we were hoping to get to today is the role of psychotherapy in the clinical management of bipolar disorder. And this is actually an excerpt from those recently published CANMAT guidelines and um, really clarify and make clear that adjunctive psychosocial and interventions may in fact be useful for the clinical management of um, bipolar disorder. And um, you can see here from this slide that they specifically mention the utility of psychosocial intervention for the treatment of acute depressive episodes, as well as in maintenance treatment to prevent relapse um, and recurrence. So um, when we, we break up our treatments, this is true for pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy, we often think of it in bipolar disorder as acute phase treatment, um, treating current level of symptoms, helping people get to a place where they may um, achieve some level of remission. And then um, the more maintenance phase treatment is where people are engaged in treatment with the goal of increasing time um, of wellness and preventing future mood episodes. And um, as we go through the literature today and the treatments today, you'll see that um, some of our psychosocial interventions have been evaluated more for the former and some have been evaluated more for the latter. So I'm going to kind of skip to the punchline with respect to the research and go back to that step BD study that I mentioned earlier, um, because one of the other trials that um, was initiated as part of the step BD program was to also conduct what was meant to be essentially a definitive trial on some psychotherapies for bipolar disorder. Um, specifically focusing on that acute phase of bipolar depression, um, which makes sense because the clinical need is so high, yet um, the pharmacotherapies we have are not as effective for bipolar depression as for mania, and there are just fewer pharmacotherapies available. So it seems like a very natural place to look to see if psychotherapies added to pharmacotherapy might improve outcomes for folks with bipolar depression. So um, almost 300 adults with bipolar depression were um, randomized in this trial. They were treated by 30 therapists across 15 sites. So this was a very ambitious study. And the treatments that they selected for evaluation were based on um, the literature that had preceded step BD. So at the point that step BD was initiated, there was already some evidence that um, cognitive behavior therapy, family focused therapy, and a treatment called interpersonal and social rhythm therapy may in fact be useful for the treatment of bipolar disorder, although not specific to bipolar depression, I should add. And um, based on the previous literature were selected for evaluation in step BD, and they were compared with a um, collaborative care control condition, which included pharmacotherapy and some brief, I think it was a three session um, brief intervention, a psychoeducation with I think some availability as needed to people, um, generally sort of a supportive psychotherapy. What you can see um, from the panel on the left is that there really was not much difference between the three active treatments, the CBT, the FFT, and the IPSRT um, in terms of time to recovery for folks. But where we see some separation is between our active psychotherapies and that control condition, where we see 50% medium time to recovery for um, those in the active interventions was 169 days compared to the collaborative care group where it was 279 days. So um, quite clinically significant. 
And then also um, focusing not just on time to recovery, but also looking at um, periods of wellness over the one year follow up, they also found that there was a significant difference between anyone who had received one of the active interventions versus someone who had received one of the control or the control of collaborative care condition. Um, so people were not only reporting that their symptoms were remitting sooner, but they were also expressing subjective feelings of wellness at greater rates during this time. So when we think about those data and we think about our treatments, um, we shouldn't necessarily expect them to perform differently than one another. Um, it's nice to see the data to see that uh, they do seem to um, provide similar uh, improvements for patients. And um, it may be driven by the fact that there are some really important common elements between these interventions. And these are just a few that come to my mind as being shared across them. Um, I certainly could argue for others probably as well. But the first being bipolar disorder psychoeducation. This is just such an important component of all of our psychosocial interventions, just really helping patients, especially patients who are receiving a new diagnosis, who had not previously recognized that they had bipolar disorder, understand just basic information about the symptoms, the disorder course, the fact that it's episodic over time, um, the different treatments that are available to them, and other factors that may contribute to their symptom morbidity, such as substance use or um, comorbid anxiety, for example. There's also an important focus across each of these interventions on mood monitoring. So identifying those associations between personal risk factors and symptom outcomes and doing that again on that prospective basis. So people can really start to learn what their patterns of symptoms may be and what some of those um, personal triggers or um, risk factors for mood symptom worsening or also mood symptom improvement um, can be over time. And so they all, their, their mood monitoring forms are slightly different between the different interventions, but they all aim to achieve the same goal. There's also a really important element here specific to treatment non-adherence. Uh, as I showed you in that slide with the, um, from our hospital here, roughly 20% of the people presenting for treatment weren't taking any medication at all. And that's something that is really important for bipolar disorder because rates of non-adherence can be quite high um, depending on the study you look at. And we also know that pharmacotherapy is so essential, not just for acute phase of care, but also maintenance phase of care. And um, while the med providers can provide the prescription, they often don't have the time and um, the frequency to address issues of non-adherence in the way that can be addressed in the psychotherapy. And so um, rightly so, the various developers of these treatments have really emphasized the importance of working with people around um, adhering not just to their medication regimens, but also adhering to treatment in terms of session attendance and engagement. And finally, again, consistent with this idea that we're focusing not just on acute care, but maintenance, is a focus on relapse prevention and identifying and intervening around early signs of recurrence. Because I always say to patients, if we can kind of put the brakes on a new mood episode before it gets um, too severe or intense for somebody, that, um, that may be a good outcome. So I'm just at this point going to go through each of those three interventions that were featured in the STEP BD trial. Um, those are the interventions that we have the most data um, to support their use in um, routine care. Starting with CBT, you'll see here that I have three different CBT manuals up on the slide. And, um, and I, I should um, have a disclosure here. I am not involved in the development of any of the treatment manuals I'll be talking about today. I've selected the ones to focus on simply because I've personally found them useful in my own practice. And um, there are slight differences between some of these um, treatment protocols, but in general, they're, I would say they're more similar than different. So if you're interested in learning, for example, about cognitive therapy for bipolar disorder, you may want to check out one or all of these manuals. Um, I should mention, too, aside from Step BD, the, the literature on CBT for bipolar disorder has been 
entirely focused on CBT as a maintenance phase treatment. So these, this is when people come into a clinical trial in um, full or partial remission and then are randomized to CBT as um, an intervention to help prevent um, future relapse or recurrence. Of course, there was a step ED trial that was focused on acute treatment of bipolar depression. There was also one um, quite large pragmatic trial in the UK and um, their equivalent of community mental health, um, which was more kind of symptomatic, little, little less um, restrictive in terms of inclusion criteria one way or the other. And, and interestingly, in that trial, there was no significant treatment effect um, for CBT, but when they did some post hoc analyses, they found some added benefit of CBT if the patient had less than 12 prior mood episodes. So the idea being that people with much more chronic bipolar disorder may get less benefit from adjunctive CBT, whereas people who've had fewer, although 11 or 10 is still quite a bit, um, episodes may derive a little bit more benefit from this kind of treatment. So to provide you with an overview of what CBT for bipolar disorder looks like, um, I'll just kind of give you an overview now. It just likes, it's very, you'll see it's very similar to CBT for major depression. It's skills-based, it can be delivered in individual or group format. It's been evaluated in both um, formats. Generally 20 sessions, although the literature has ranged from as low as six sessions of CBT to 22 in clinical trials. Just like um, CBT that we know and love for depression and anxiety, it incorporates monitoring of behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. And um, similarly, focus on cognitive distortions and maladaptive behaviors that may maintain or trigger new mood symptoms. So thinking about what might be unique or different about CBT for bipolar disorder, um, certainly cognitions of focus will include those same depressogenic cognitions about the self, the others, and the future that we focus on in CBT for unipolar depression, ideas such as things will never work out for me, I'll be alone forever. But what CBT for bipolar disorder also incorporates is a unique focus on the overly optimistic or other unrealistic beliefs that may be more manicogenic. And that's why I think people have also been focusing on CBT as a maintenance treatment versus an acute treatment, because obviously this would be very hard to do for somebody who's in a current manic episode, but for somebody who has the benefit of hindsight and re can reflect on a prior manic episode, to think through what are those automatic thoughts or beliefs that accompany those manic symptoms, they can start to monitor and address those as they come up. So I just came up with this example. I just know that I'm gonna hit the jackpot at the casino this weekend. So that might be the kind of um, overly optimistic or manicogenic thought that could be addressed with cognitive restructuring and um, thought monitoring over time. Um, behaviors of focus is also quite similar. We can use experimental, um, you know, behavior experiments in CBT for bipolar disorder. There's also um, a focus on regulation of behavior versus um, more in CBT for depression. We focus on kind of behavior activation. We just want to activate folks, get them, get them moving, get them out of an anhedonic or depressive state. But of course, the risk in bipolar disorder is that might be overly activating for folks. And so we really focus around this idea of behavior regulation versus activation so that the patient isn't at either end of the extreme. So certainly if somebody is in extreme avoidance or isolation in a depressive state, the goal would be to get them moving and out of bed and re-engaged in their lives. But um, but we do, again, we want to just be cautious about being overly activating there. But then on the other end, also thinking about um, behaviors that may contribute to mania, this idea of extreme goal pursuit and how that relates to placing somebody at risk for new hypomanic or manic symptoms, getting a new job, um, getting married. Um, all of those are positive life events, but we just need to be mindful of the risks and um, monitor them. Uh, CBT for bipolar disorder also recognizes that routine stability is very important for folks, especially with respect to sleep and other daily activities. I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about IPSRT. And it also emphasizes behaviors regarding treatment adherence, like I mentioned earlier. It's one of those common elements that's shared across the disorders. Um, 
just a few notes about CBT, again, regarding the evidence. Um, when compared to treatment as usual, there is some evidence that CBT for bipolar disorder, especially for maintenance treatment, I should emphasize, will reduce the rate of rehospitalization, reduce the rate and time to relapse or recurrence, and that may be more so for depression than for mania, um, for a lot of the reasons I've already shared and um, from step ED may be beneficial in the acute treatment of bipolar depression. But when CBT is compared to more active interventions, um, like in step ED, um, like IPSRT or FFT, but even in other clinical trials where they've sort of randomized to CBT or like a really active psychoed, there, um, there's evidence that it's really no more effective than other active psychotherapies. So um, sort of a comparative effectiveness way of thinking about it. So moving on, um, I gave you a brief overview of CBT. It's also really important when we talk about psychotherapies for bipolar disorder that we um, talk about IPSRT, which is also a treatment that, um, from my experience, fewer people know about or people know less about or have heard about. Um, and um, it's, it's a unique intervention in that it really blends elements of interpersonal psychotherapy for depression with a unique behavioral intervention focused on social and circadian rhythm stability for mania. And for that reason, it really was initially formulated as a prophylactic treatment. Um, the idea being that you're sort of, it's like I call it the one-two punch. You're gonna get, you're gonna work on depression with the IPT and you're gonna work on social rhythm and circadian stability, which can place people at risk for mania. Um, and the focus really being on preventing future episodes. It's, um, it can be a lengthy intervention. It was initially developed to be delivered in up to two years, but um, it has been evaluated in shorter durations as well. And I already spoke to the IPT and the social rhythm components of IPSRT, um, but there's actually a third pathway that um, to mood episode recurrence that IPSRT focuses on. And I think it, it, people pay little attention to this. And I, I often say it might just be because it's not part of the name, um, whereas IPT and social rhythm therapy are sort of blended into the actual name of the treatment. Um, there's nothing in there about treatment adherence. But in terms of how the treatment's been conceptualized and developed, there's a very strong emphasis on psychoeducation um, for the purpose of enhancing treatment adherence over time. So um, IPSRT in practice, what does this look like? So again, this is just a snapshot overview for all of you. It um, starts off with relying on the use of what they call, this is Ellen Frank's treatment, I should mention, the illness history timeline to generate a personalized case formulation. And that really informs application of the other intervention components moving forward. So the idea is it's not just a way for the clinician to assess what the illness history has looked like, but through a discussion of the illness history, starting to identify the links between um, social and circadian rhythm disruption. And when I say social rhythm disruption, I'm talking about um, activities of the daily life, like what time you wake up in the morning, what time do you go to bed at night, what time do you eat your meals, what time do you go to work, what time um, do you exercise or take your dog out for a walk. Um, the idea is that when those social rhythms are dysregulated or not um, regularized, that that then will um, disrupt the circadian rhythm system and put people at risk for new mood symptoms. And so the idea is if we can um, routinize or regularize those social rhythms, those activities of daily life, that will help entrain the circadian system and therefore help somebody have a more stable mood moving forward. And so that illness history timeline is really important because you're using information from the person's own life to start identify times where maybe there was a big disruption to their social rhythms or something else in their lives, like a really important life event that may have been related to their mood symptoms moving forward or in the past really. And then using that knowledge to then um, educate them about the importance of these um, these events and these routines in their lives and moving forward with the treatment. Um, 
Looking at the slide, just uh, very brief, the psychoeducation, as I mentioned before, is a really important part. It's very important at the beginning of treatment, but it's important to just kind of blend in throughout the whole course of care. Those elements of IPT are, are meant to be integrated into the treatment to address depression, um, emphasizing the link between mood and interpersonal stressors. And um, just like an IPT for depression, there's also a focus in that those early sessions around conducting an interpersonal inventory to identify those key areas of relevance for somebody, such as role transitions, role disputes, interpersonal deficits, and interpersonal grief. Um, one area that Dr. Frank had really um, focused on when developing IPSRT and in its practice is um, recognizing that Aside from interpersonal grief, there can also be grief for the lost healthy self, um, which comes from sort of a chronic illness model of care and um, helping people sort of recognize the way their lives have changed as a function of having bipolar disorder and coming to some acceptance and understanding about um, some expectations that they may have had for their future that may um, need to be adjusted or, or real losses that they've experienced as a function of their um, mood symptoms over time. Uh, as I mentioned before, IPSRT also incorporates these unique behavioral interventions meant to improve social rhythm, um, stability, and address risk for mania. It emphasizes these really clearly in a very concrete way, emphasizes links between the regular routines or those routine disrupt disruptions and mood. The goal is to regularize those daily routines to entrain the circadian rhythm system. And um, it also makes use of a social rhythm metric, which is a, a monitoring form that is used to monitor and set goals for daily routines. So um, this is just an example of what the social rhythm metric looks like. The original social rhythm metric actually had 17 different um, types of activities that people could focus on in terms of setting target times and goals for the week. Over time, um, the research group out of Pittsburgh realized that that could be distilled down into five um, primary areas. But certainly what I've done in my own practice is add to the social rhythm metric. I usually use this five um, item one, but if there's a specific area that's very unique to my patient, we'll just add it onto the form and um, set our target time and our goals for the week there. And this is, again, just a way of monitoring the social rhythms and making changes to one's um, routine to achieve, hopefully, the treatment goals that would be uh, associated with social rhythm stability. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, IPSRT tends to be lengthier than CBT for bipolar disorder. Um, it's conceptualized as being delivered in four phases. So there's that initial phase with weekly sessions focused again on that clinical history, that illness history timeline, psychoeducation about the disorder, initiating the social rhythm metric and conducting the interpersonal inventory. So I kind of think of that as being several weeks of just setting the stage for changes moving forward. And then in that intermediate phase, it's kind of the meat of the intervention weekly sessions, which are meant to generate and implement behavioral strategies to manage mood symptoms and stabilize routines, and of course, implement other strategies to address the interpersonal problem areas that may also be um, affecting people's moods. There's also the maintenance phase of treatment, um, which is meant to be more of the relapse prevention phase, and then of course, the termination phase. Um, where people prepare for termination. So, and I'm also, I'm getting a little ping from ADAA that our time is getting close to the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip just to say, um, IPSRT was part of that step ED trial. So there's some evidence that it can be effective in the acute treatment of bipolar depression. It um, has been evaluated in some smaller trials with adolescents. Um, there's some interest in using it as a monotherapy for bipolar two disorder. We've also been evaluating IPSRT as a treatment for symptomatic women who are pregnant and postpartum. So I do want to make sure we have enough time to talk about family-focused treatment for bipolar disorder. That's the third active intervention that was included in FFT or in uh, Step BD. This is grounded in a model that implicates what's known as high expressed emotion as a maintenance factor and predictor of symptom recurrence in bipolar disorder. And expressed emotion is comprised of three main components: hostility emotional over-involvement and criticism. So 
FFT is really designed to intervene on those levels to improve mood symptoms for the identified patient. It consists of up to 21 sessions with the patient and a family member, could be a spouse or other family member or other significant other. Um, the way this looks in practice is that it starts with an assessment of the patient and the family. There's an engagement phase. There's some psychoeducation around the need for medication adherence. And then a big component of the intervention is focused on communication skills training to intervene on the level of EE and identify more effective ways to respond to mood, mood symptoms. And this can even involve behavioral rehearsal of effective speaking and listening and other communication skills. And it also integrates problem solving around family difficulties and conflicts. The one limitation and um, criticism that sometimes is shared about FFT is that it can be limited to patients who have a family member who are willing and are able to participate in the treatment. Unfortunately, some people with bipolar disorder have limited social support networks and may not have a family member um, willing or, or another important person in their lives willing to participate. So FFT can be a really um, important treatment to include in someone's care plan, but it can also be difficult to integrate if they don't have somebody to participate with them. Um, there's some evidence, I'm kind of going to skip ahead of some of this again due to time, there's some evidence that FFT does in fact um, reduce risk for relapse and rehospitalization for patients um, and can be more effective um, for depression over time um, than necessarily mania. Um, very briefly, these were not included in the step BD trial, but these are two other treatments that I found incredibly useful and have a really nice evidence base. Um, one is standalone psychoeducation. Um, this is typically delivered in a group format, and there's some really nice evidence that this can be useful also for prevention of relapse and recurrence. And they even have data for psychoed um, up to five years after the initial psychoed groups. There's also a program called the Life Goals Program, which is a systematic care management program that's integrated into routine care. It's been primarily evaluated in the VA hospital setting. And this is actually the one psychosocial intervention that does have some evidence for preventing future manic symptom relapse and um, recurrence. And it's a, it's a really nice intervention if you're interested in learning more about it. There's the um, manual. Also just like to very quickly address um, the role of bibliotherapy and um, workbooks that can be useful. Again, I have no stake in any of these treatments. I was not involved in the development of any of them, but um, I found them all very useful in my own clinical practice. David Miklowitz, who developed FFT, wrote the really practical and useful bipolar survival guide. Mark Bauer, who developed the Life Goals program, um, has the Overcoming Bipolar Disorder workbook, which touches on some of the elements of life goals. Then, of course, we have our CBT workbooks as well, which can be used in concert with um, CBT therapy. There's also some really nice online resources for patients. I always feel a little um, ambivalent about the internet because I know as much as there can be useful information, sometimes that I cringe a bit at what I find online. Um, so knowing where to look is really important. And so these are some places that I found very um, useful, practical, and most importantly, evidence-based in terms of the information that's being shared with patients. The, um, the Mood Network is, uh, is, I believe it's funded by the patient-centered, Corey, I'm not remembering what the acronym is complete at this moment, but um, that's a really nice place. It's developed, um, primarily for patient engagement. Um, they have online mood symptom monitoring, they have message boards, they have clinicians from Mass General interacting with patients online in, um, in ways that are appropriately boundaried. Um, there's also a really nice program out of Canada called the Bipolar Wellness Center, which is um, sponsored by the Crest BD Bipolar Disorders Treatment Network that has a lot of um, self-guided um, supports for people with bipolar disorder online. Again, evidence-based, there's some interaction with clinicians if needed. And, um, and then here's a, one smartphone app that I've, some of my patients have been using. Actually, one of my patients found this herself and showed it to me. And I love it so much because um, 
she, you can, there's some built-in elements to it that allow you to track depression, mania, anxiety, but then patients can also add their own symptoms and other features that are important to them. And it actually will generate a report. And so we can review it um, session to session. She'll actually send me her report prior to the session so I can review it before we meet. Um, so again, I have no stake in this. I don't even know who developed this app, but um, I tend to like this one. And then of course, useful resources for clinicians. I think that can be really important. Bipolar disorder is a complex disorder and um, it, it's really important to feel when you're working with someone with bipolar disorder, I think it's important to feel like you really understand bipolar illness. And so um, David Miklitz and Michael Gitlin have this really nice clinician's guide to bipolar disorder that I found really helpful. I've used this in my training um, with folks who are learning to treat bipolar disorder. And um, Ellen Frank and her colleagues at Pittsburgh have created a super cool, I think, um, online resource to um, learn IPSRT. They have um, all sorts of resources online. They have videos, they have um, quizzes. I think at one point you could even get CE credits for doing the training, although I'm not sure that's still supported. I believe that's, it's either IPSRT.org or IPSRT.com. And um, it's a wonderful resource for anyone who's lo looking to learn IPSRT. So I would um, really encourage you to check those resources out. So at that point, I'll stop um, and say thank you for listening and take any questions that may come from the group. Thank you so much, Dr. Reinstock, for your excellent presentation covering not only psychosocial treatments, but also pharmacology and the public health aspects. We have two, two three minutes for some questions. Uh, I think one question that you also mentioned in your talk is you were, when, when you're talking about comorbid conditions in BDD, such as substance abuse, suicide, history of, of trauma, how, which are the typical ones that you have seen coming up in patients with BD1 or BD2? I, I well, the, the short answer is all of the above. Um, but um, I think in terms of suicide risk in particular, it's just my routine to ask everyone about suicide risk at every point of contact. Um, even if somebody has not had any active suicide ideation in quite some time, I just let them know up front, I'm gonna ask you about this every time we meet. The risk for um, suicide is so high in bipolar disorder that I, I think it's imperative that we always assess risk. Um, other people may not agree with me on that, but that's that's my particular take on it. I think comorbid anxiety is another area. It's just very, very common. What I see um, most commonly, it really is a, a variety. I see um, patients who present with a lot of social anxiety, and then that interacts with bipolar disorder in some unique ways because people start to become feeling very self-conscious about their bipolar disorder mood symptoms which then prevents them from engaging socially with others. And it just kind of maintains the social anxiety, which then of course isolation from the social anxiety can maintain the bipolar mood symptoms. So social anxiety I think is a big one that I think needs to be addressed. And, um, and the order in which these things are addressed will vary personally, I think, depending on what are the immediate clinical needs, um, sometimes, the mood stabilization is the primary focus and that really needs to be the focus first before then addressing the social anxiety. Other times the social anxiety is so severe that it's sort of preventing anyone from engaging in any of the behavioral activities we would recommend for treating the mood symptoms and so maybe you'd want to address the anxiety first. Um, substance use can also be quite common in bipolar disorder and so, and I, and the way I, I address that, if it's someone needs immediate substance use treatment, I would usually refer somebody to that. But um, otherwise I would sort of loop it into the regular uh, monitoring of the case and, and also helping people recognize the associations between the substance use and the mood symptoms and recognizing that those things are very interconnected. Um, whether it's that they're using a substance that then exacerbates their mood symptoms or whether their mood symptoms actually contribute to their substance use. For example, somebody who's more hypomanic or manic who um, may be seeking more hedonic pleasure, 
um, might be using substances and that might be triggered by the mood symptoms rather than vice versa. So really trying to understand those patterns and then helping patients understand those patterns moving forward can help address some of those areas clinically. Thank you so much for all this information. This is very helpful. I think just a just quickly a very last question. I think must have in, in, intrigued ma many attendees. You were talking about the new CanMet gu guidelines, and yeah. you did show a slide. Could you just briefly summarize what are these new what are the new aspects of the guidelines that might be helpful for researchers and clinicians? Uh, the guidelines are about 150 pages long. Um, so I, and unfortunately, I don't think I could really summarize them now, but um, the way they're broken up, and I just, I haven't fully digested them myself because these were just published in March and they're free, they're free online. So they're published in the journal Bipolar Disorders, but they're outside the firewall. So they're available to everyone. I'd recommend um, printing out a copy or saving a PDF on your own computer. Um, there's some basic information about things like anxiety, comorbidity, suicide risk, substance use that's meant to inform um, clinicians' practice. And then it's just a very big overview in terms of what's recommended. Um, a lot of the focus is on the pharmacotherapy and they break it down into acute maintenance care, depression, mania, hypomania. Um, mixed episode receives a lot of attention in the CANMAC guidelines. And then it's just, there's a lot of figures and tables where they'll review the evidence supporting the different um, medications that are available. A lot of these are used off label. They're not FDA approved. I mean, even the CANMAC guidelines come from Canada. So um, it's a little bit of a different regulatory approval there. Um, and they, they organize it by which interventions have first line support, which interventions have second line support, which interventions, I believe they go as low as third line support, and then they also will determine whether certain interventions have insufficient evidence. So in the psychotherapy world, I noted that um, DBT was mentioned briefly in the CANMAC guidelines, but there isn't a lot of clinical research focused on DBT for bipolar disorder. There's just been a teeny little bit um, Tina Goldstein at Pittsburgh has been um, evaluating DBT for treatment of bipolar youth. And so for the treatment of adults, that essentially is labeled as insufficient evidence at this time, which is not to say that DBT may not be useful. We just need the research to support um, what we think may be true. So, um, and that's why they update these guidelines over time, because as more research becomes available and there's more evidence, um, then we, we can feel a little bit more confident about the potential effectiveness of any of the interventions that we choose to use. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weinstock, for still answering this question. And thank you very much to you for your excellent presentation and to our attendees who, who who were here today you will all receive a follow-up email within 48 hours that includes a link to the evaluation and a link to the recording of the webinar please do share your thoughts even if you're not requesting CE. if you're not yet an ada member please consider becoming one. ADA offers an excellent members benefits package such as year-long access to continuing education, free access to special interest groups including peer online consultation groups, significant discount to ADA's annual four-day conference, promotion of your clinical practice in ADA's online find a therapist database and much more. We hope you will join us at the anxiety and depression conference March 27th to 31st in Chicago. And on behalf of ADA and our presenters, thank you so much.